anybody is struggling with any type of affliction with addiction, please just reach out to me. You know, I dealt with that for years, literally a decade. Uh, but I'm more than happy to talk to anybody who's dealing with that because I don't want to have to bury somebody else. You know, I don't want to have to bury another friend. I just don't. I can't do it. So please, you're not alone. You're not alone in this. If you're struggling, just reach out. You don't have to do this by yourself. There's a way out of it. I found it. It works. It's much, much prettier on this side. I can promise you that. My weekend was interesting, to say the least. You know, I, uh, the way I was brought up and, and the, the life I used to live is very different than the life I live now. So, um, you know, in the past five years, I've lost a friend every single year to uh, drug overdose, which is very sad and unfortunate. But this past one was my cousin. Uh, we were two months apart. I went to his service yesterday. And, uh, you know, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate these, these people continue to die, you know, and it, and it brings a lot of sadness, but also a lot of gratitude into my life because that could have been me, you know, by the grace of God, there go I. So uh, less about that, more about y'all. How's your business doing? What's going on? Talk to me. I want to know. So as the 28th, the FBA fee increases happened, uh, which, like I said on the last Sunday sessions, it's not really going to affect any of you. It's going to be pushed back onto the consumer as long as you're staying, staying up to it, staying up to date, repricing your products properly. First three to six weeks, you'll eat it, and then it'll get past the consumer, so don't worry about that. Appreciate the love, everybody. You know, it's just very... Uh, it's very surreal seeing a Castellano in the uh, at the funeral. You know, it was just it was just different. It's just different. My fridge, my fridge is lined with people who have passed away. So it's uh, it's important that that I think people talk about it because not a lot of people. It's like every funeral I go to where someone dies from a drug overdose. Uh, nobody wants to talk about it. It's almost like a mystery. It's like, oh, there's just such a great person. And, and it's like, yeah, but what about all the pain? You know, and I know it's tough to talk about that because you're trying to remember the person and for what, for what they were, uh, you know, amazing at or their great qualities. But at the end of the day, like that person was suffering, you know, and they couldn't escape it. They died because of it. It's very unfortunate. So, yeah, it's an emotional weekend, you know. Definitely was. Yeah, I know my video sideways. <laughs> it's also live on YouTube right now. So welcome to check it out there if you want more of a experience. Top of the morning. It's another beautiful day. Sunday Sessions, episode 26. Here to deliver a ton of information about how you can efficiently grow your Amazon business. See you inside. Stay lit. Amazon thing goes booming right now you know I'm uh, I'm a firm believer we leverage all our business into Amazon FBA so a lot of people they diversify doing FBM FBA right now FBA is literally so lucrative you know we're pumping out hundred eighty thousand dollar days and that that won't happen overnight probably won't even happen in a year or two but with dedication determination discipline you can replicate those sales as well um, in your own business and drive revenue, which in turn drives profit, which in turn builds a healthier Amazon company. And it doesn't happen overnight. It takes a lot of time. But if you if you dedicate the time and you're consistent with it, it will happen. It's like anything. It's like going to the gym. You know, if you go to the gym for four days, you're not going to get ripped. You're not going to leave there with a six pack and a fat ass. You're just, you're just not. You know, it's just not gonna happen. You gotta dedicate the time. You gotta work towards it. It's the same thing in everything else in your life. Your spiritual growth, your mental health, your emotional health, your business health, your business growth. It's all parallel to the way you treat yourself and the way you interact with other people and the way your mindset is. You know, but unfortunately, most of our mindsets are broken because the way we were raised, you know, to touch back on, on my cousin Clint who passed away over the weekend. You know, we were raised like our family, we're not, we're not responsible for what our family, the way they raised us, but it plays a huge role on the people that we become, you know? So it's important to be able to break that cycle if you're stuck in it, recognizing what the problems are, breaking it and moving out of it. It's very challenging for certain people to do that though, because these behaviors are ingrained in them 
since being children. So it's tough to kind of break out of that cycle, but it's possible. It's definitely possible. So I know most of our viewers are usually retail arbitrage guys or girls or booksellers, online arbitrage, right? Which is beautiful for growing a business, but I'm about to deliver some game on y'all right now because RA, OA, books, great for generating sales, building the foundation of your company. Very challenging to scale it out like that. Very, very challenging, right? Yeah, you can get 500,000 in sales, a million dollars in sales, probably even break two or three with retail arbitrage and online arbitrage. I know a few guys doing, girls doing a little more than that, but like to exceed that, very challenging. And now I talk a lot about sales revenue post pictures of sales revenue. It can be deceiving when you see that, right? But we're volume guys. The way I see it at the end of the day is I wanna sell as many products as possible because it helps build my reputation on Amazon, right? Amazon is a trust basis relationship. So the more they trust your Amazon business, the more they'll allocate the buy box to you. You know, the more they'll offer you new pilot programs that they're offering, right? And the, the larger amount of seller feedback you'll get. So like all of that is a win-win. So when I think of volume, it's like, I want to sell as many products as possible. I don't mind sacrificing a few profit points because if I sacrifice, let's say I'm operating $100,000 a month business at 20% margins, right? So $20,000 in gross profits is coming back into my pocket. That's great, right? But let's say I double that business and sacrifice five points on my margin. So the business goes from 200,000, but now I'm operating at a 15% margin. You know, so now that 20,000 in profit goes to $30,000 in profit. So I'm not focused on the percentage. I'm focused on the dollar amount. And all of us should be focused on the dollar amount because not only does doubling your business, once again, build trust with Amazon, get you more seller feedback because less than 1% of buyers leave seller feedback. It also helps with the buy box allocation and then increasing your SKU count and getting a little wider gives you more opportunity and more reach to different customers. So it's like encompassing all of those things into your business with the mindset of scaling and growth and looking into the future instead of just focusing on okay what do i need to do today it's like no let me what needs to be done today this week and this month let me have my employees do that let me hire someone to take care of the day to day so i can focus and really hunker down and build out a vision for the future. Because without a vision for the future, your business will not excel. You'll just plateau. You might see some growth and some drops, but eventually you will plateau if you're just focused on the day-to-day. -day. If you're focused on the day-to-day, -day, it's impossible to get out of the day-to-day -day because you're so focused on it that you can't leave it. So then you're just stuck in between a rock and a hard place and you can't accelerate that growth any longer. It becomes very complicated to break that cycle and break that chain because you're so used to it stuck in the day to day that you can't break out of it. And before you know it, 12 months goes by, 18 months goes by, 24 months goes by, and your business is not scaling the way you want it to, and you wanna blame it on everybody else because that's what I did, right? Everything I talk about is experience of my own. I wanna blame it on everybody else, but this guy didn't do this, or this distributor didn't do this. But at the end of the day, it's your fault, it's my fault. If I'm not taking the action to improve my processes, delegate tasks properly and hire the right team, then the business is going to stay stagnant. And stagnant for me, stagnant for Sebastian, is absolutely not an option. It's not an option for us. You know, we've committed many years ago to ensure that we will be the largest Amazon sellers in the world, right? And we're building every day to that goal. And we're gonna do whatever has to be done to get there. And you need to be as committed to your dreams as we are to ours. Because the lack of commitment is what separates the people who achieve those goals and the people who do not. It's very simple when you analyze it, but it's complicated to put it into practice. Very complicated to put it into practice. So you gotta make connections for the disconnections to get it all together. Let's see if we got any questions. Here's one. Eric, what kind of a pricing strategy are you using? Smart way to increase and still get the buy box range. For example, are you guys stop repricing for 30 minutes or be at max for about 30 minutes and let the market? So we're, I'm not looking really at any of that. You know, I'm integrating a repricer like Seller Snap, which if anybody wants to use it, send me a DM, be happy to get you 
a high discount for a couple months, but like where pricers manage all that for me. So I set my minimum floor price, which for us is right around 10%, 10% gross margin, minimum floor price. And then I set the ceiling or my repricing specialist sets the ceiling at a reasonable price that won't get any high pricing errors, right? So we look at like the average highest price and go 10% above that. So we're not getting any high pricing errors. But once we set it, it's not forget it. We look back at it and we create reports. Like let's say uh, after two weeks, we have a report that will run two weeks products at their floor price. So if a product's at the floor price, it means it hasn't sold. It can't go any lower, it's stuck at the floor. You can't go lower than the floor, you can't go to the basement. You can't go to the basement if your product's at its floor price. So the only way is to drop that price to the basement, lower the floor. So we do that a lot as well. You know, but we usually like to wait up to 30 days before we make drastic price changes because our team is trained very well, our buying team, and they made an executive decision to purchase that product for a reason, right? So let's play it out. Unless something crazy happens to the keep a chart where a seller jumps in with 5,000 units and the ASIN's only selling 1,000 a month and they got five months of inventory, then I'm making a decision to drop that price. So here's a good question. What's a good ROI for beginners profit margin? So I, I, I rarely like to look at return on investment. It just skews your numbers a lot, right? Because when you're analyzing the health of a company, you're not looking at your return on investment. You're looking at how much cash came in, right? What is my profit dollar amount, which can be equated to a, a gross profit margin and a net profit margin right? The dollars. It's all about the dollars. But to answer your question, Omar, I think a healthy ROI for new sellers is right around 20%, right? Because in the beginning, your focus needs to be, like I said before, volume. Your focus has to be volume. If you're not focusing on volume and you're just looking for high, high profiting items, it's going to limit your growth potential because there's only so many products you can sell that fit those metrics that you're looking for. So it really eliminates the opportunity to crush it and scale quickly because you're so focused on making 15, $20 an item. Don't get me wrong, some people, that's all they wanna do. You know, they wanna not operate a very large business, they just wanna make an extra couple thousand dollars a month, and that's okay, you can do that too. But if you're looking to scale this thing to the next level, then you gotta make sacrifices in your ROI and your profit margins initially, and then you can really scale them back up. So 20% ROI would really be the cutoff, 10% gross profit margin would be the cutoff for us. That's how we operate. Initially, it was even lower, seven and a half percent. You know, so it really depends on what your goals are for the future of your company. Do we buy a product if it shows gross profit or only net profit after factoring in all the production costs? That's a great question, Ulyss. So the question was, if we run the numbers and based on our expenses, we're breaking even on that product when you subtract the cost to produce it, the, the cost to ship it, the boxes and everything included, we may be breaking even on that product, but we're absolutely initially taking a product like that on, Ulyss, because what it does is it builds the relationship with the vendor. You know, so those won't be the only products we're buying from these vendors, but we will incorporate these products into our business. So let's say we're ordering 10 products. Two of them we may be breaking even on as far as gross profit goes, right? So we're, we're, we're not making any net profit on it. The gross profit is eaten from the expenses to produce it, but we still buy it because it builds the relationship with the vendor. You know, and a lot of times we'll ask our vendors, hey, you got anything extra you're trying to get rid of? Because I want to be of maximum service to you. You know, this is a two-sided relationship. One hand wash the other, both wash the face. This is not just me take, take, take. This is a take, give, take, give, and then gain relationship. So I'm willing to take Take a break even on some of these products for the future of the relationship. Sonny's got a question. He said, Amazon is not reimbursing our lost FBA shipments, 10K worth. I tried calling and emailing and they're giving me such a hard time. At this point, I'm hesitant to send anything into FBA. What should I do? You gotta just be consistent. You know, if you're submitting all the documentation, I'm sure they're asking for invoices, probably a bill of lading, proof of shipment, which they're gonna want the SKU count, the ACEs that were sent on that shipment, as well as the weight. Submitting that documentation documentation and being persistent. So a member of eSellers or I, about four months ago, we brought up a very similar situation, except instead of 10K, it was 16K. Took them four months, but I gave them the same advice. Make sure you're being persistent. Keep reaching out, keep calling them. Submit the proper documentation. Make sure your invoice 
is the right invoice. It has proof that you purchased the units. You're sending the bill of lading. You're sending proof of shipment weight to prove that these products were actually on the shipment. And just keep calling them. Keep calling them. Be persistent. And if you get someone on the phone, say, hey, I'd like to speak to your superior. Because that first person, your first point of contact with Seller Central, is usually never the person that's gonna solve the problem. Very rarely, sometimes they do. So long story short, Dylan, he got his reimbursement a week ago and he was so pumped about it. You know, also another trick is, shoot, I forgot the, it's a Twitter account. It's not Jeff Bezos. So you, I'd have to get back to you on that, but posting it on Twitter and tagging, there's two or three accounts you can tag where if it, if it kind of blows up, start getting some comments and some likes. Amazon actually sees that very active on Twitter and that's a chance to get your account or your reimbursement back as well. Here's another question from Joey. Hey Eric, I'm doing wholesale and scaling. I consider a warehouse, but it sounds more beneficial to use prep and pay fees to prep centers. Just cracking six figs solo. What sales point y'all got a warehouse? So it depends on where you live, what your business model is, what kind of money you're making. The way I see it is I always like to analyze for situations like this where someone's considering moving their products from a prep center to a warehouse. It's like, all right, how much money are you spending on a prep center monthly? So you break that down. Let's say, what'd you say? You're doing 100K a month, six figs. Let's just call it 100K. So six figs, so let's do 100,000. Let's just say your average product selling for $30. So you're selling about 3,333 items a month. Let's just say average prep cost is 125. So you're looking at about 4,100. These are just numbers, right? Arbitrary numbers. Pretty accurate though, right? So you're looking at about $4,100 in prep costs every single month. Now let's say your business doubles in the next three months. That prep cost goes from 4,100 to $8,200 a month. Now it's like, okay, let me weigh the cost benefits of getting a warehouse that's gonna cost me 4,000 or 5,000 a month, putting employees in that warehouse, another you figure paying someone $600 a week times four, that's $2,400, so that's another two employees, that's $4,800. So you're right around the same $8,000, but now you have the opportunity to grow within your business because every production employee you hire generates ridiculous amount of money. I'm talking up to $800 a day in profit a prepper will bring into your business. So you really gotta weigh the cost, right? So over here in New Jersey or New York, maybe leveraging a prep center makes sense, but if you live in Wisconsin, or Indiana where you can get a warehouse for seven to nine dollars a square foot then absolutely it would make sense to get that warehouse to lower your prep fees and also increase your quality control so a lot of what we do with our warehouse is not only saving in cost for prep but it's also about the quality control that the product that the customer is going to get at the end of the day so real beauty outlet asks if i know any cpas or accountants who are really good at understanding the nuances of e-commerce in the tri-state area so ecom cpa is a great guy very knowledgeable solely focuses on e-commerce businesses He's not in the tri-state area, but in today's day and age, it doesn't really matter because they're pulling the reports, they're they're doing your accounting for you. So as far as tri-state area, I don't have any re recommendations, but Ecom CPA, he's uh, very knowledgeable, got a lot of respect for the guy. He's very, very intelligent in what he does. And he's great at looking for ways to lower your tax burden by making those end of the year purchases or allocating funds to this instead of this. Very good at that. Very good at that. Sonny Marvin asked, how often do you get increases in FBA storages? So we don't really need increase. Well, that's a lie. We do need increases in FBA storages, but for hazmat and oversized aerosol products, not really for our regular storage, but the way Amazon has kind of changed their algorithm for increasing people's storage allocation is if you're using it or not. Right, so let's say you have a storage limit of 2,000. Your available inventory in Amazon is only 1,000. So you're at a 50% storage capacity. They have absolutely no reason to give you any more storage because you're only using 50% of your current storage. So the best way and the optimal way to increase your storage is to practically max out your current storage send in your fastest selling SKUs, right? SKUs that aren't gonna sit around for 60, 90, 180 days, SKUs that are gonna move 
in that 30 day or less time period, choosing those to send first, and then Amazon will see that you're using 98, 99, 100% of your storage, and your sell through rate is perfect, you're moving the inventory, you have enough turns, so they're gonna allocate more storage to you than they would to somebody who's utilizing that 50%. Right, so it's different for every business, but that's the equation. That's how to get your storage increased. Maximize your storage, make sure you have a high sell-through rate of the inventory you're selling, so Amazon sees that you're using your current storage capacity, and then they can increase it to a higher capacity for you. Do you still believe that it's possible for a person to scale and get profit as a non-US resident after cutting expenses of shipping, print centers, and warehouse fees? Absolutely, so we have about 30 members in eSellers RI that represent 30 13 different countries, Colombia, Brazil, United Kingdom, Australia, which is a continent, I believe, not a country. Uh, might be both, I'm not sure, my geography is a little off, but also France, Italy, Germany, literally so many different countries, and, and these people are profitable, right? But when you're selling in a different country, you kind of have to do the opposite of what I talked about more, right? You gotta be a little less on the volume side and more on focusing on getting those products that are gonna win for you, you know? Because if you're looking for volume and you're pumping out tons of volume, but your business isn't bringing in any profits, then it's like you could be doing that for a year, 18 months before you increase it, so you definitely Definitely want to make sure your margins on the products that you're picking are a little higher if you're operating the business from overseas because you got to account for those additional service fees. Is the ultimate goal to get exclusive with brands once established a good relationship? Do you always pitch exclusivity? So no, we do not always pitch exclusivity, but definitely one of the end goals is to get exclusivity. The way I see Amazon operating the next two to five years is a lot of these companies that have 12, 15 Amazon sellers on it, they're going to be one or two Amazon sellers on it through an exclusivity deal um, on the back end of Amazon because these companies want more control of their products. So do we always pitch exclusivity? No, but do we pitch it sometimes? Yes, now there's a certain way to pitch it. I wanna make sure the brand's willing to spend on advertising. I'm making sure that they're willing to give me their trademark number to enroll them in brand registry. I'm making sure they're willing to allow me to enhance their listings, add videos, add better images, infographics, increase their SEO optimization on those listings. So like it is important to build exclusivity because you're able to have more control, but it's also very challenging to get exclusivity if you're a newer seller because you don't have much skin in the game. But one of the benefits that most people think is a weakness and not a strength is when you're initially starting, you can let them know that you're a smaller team and they have direct access to you as the owner of the company, which is amazing because some of these bigger companies like iServe, iServe has hundreds of employees. So it's like, if you get an exclusivity and iServe's representing you, the ability to contact someone directly becomes more challenging because now there's different tiers, different phone numbers and support help instead of someone having your direct phone number and calling you, James, and being like, hey, James, you know, what's up? I see this listing, it's increasing sales. We're about to be out of stock. Is the next order coming in? And you're like, yeah, I'm submitting it in an hour. You know, so that direct relationship is important. For someone just starting out, what would be the initial investment? Is it difficult to win the buy box without seller reviews? What would be realistic time range to hit 100K a month? So initially for wholesale initial investment, we suggest three to $5,000 for inventory, which could usually split between two to three purchase orders from two to three different uh, distributors or wholesalers. Now, if you're looking to get into the RA or the OA game, you're definitely cost of entry is much lower you know OA RA you can start with a hundred bucks you can go to your local store and start scanning stuff buy a few products just to learn the game a little bit I encourage people to always learn the game a little bit by doing some RA or OA before you get into wholesale because it teach you about the process of creating a listing sending it to Amazon managing customer returns stuff like that yeah it's a little more difficult to get uh, the buy box without seller reviews but it's not impossible everybody at one point us included had zero seller reviews you know now I think we have 140 150 thousand it is possible because we all started there everybody started as a new Amazon business with zero reviews and now all of a sudden they operate a business with more reviews and they're getting more buy box allocation now what is a realistic time range to hit 
100K a month. So your cost of goods is going to make up about 40%, 38 to 40% of your product sales. So to hit 100K a month, you're going to have to spend about $40,000 to hit that 100K. So as long as it takes you to build up to get to that 40K and spend per month, where you have $40,000 of cost of goods that's selling every single month, you can do six figures a month. But until you can reach that, it's gonna be challenging because you just don't have the inventory in stock to do that. So normally, most people on average, usually takes about a year. People in our program, usually two to four months. If they have a little bit of experience, they're doing around 10, 15,000 a month. Getting them to six figures happens right around two to four months. Um, if you're brand new, it's probably gonna take a little longer. Than Listen, my friends, this has been a pleasure and an honor. I have to jump into a call at 11.50, so I gotta break out of here, but have a beautiful Sunday. Sunday Sessions, episode 26. See you on the next one. Stay late.